Yeah, hi everybody. Um, good afternoon. So this talk is about a project that's been mentioned earlier, EOSIS. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and some work that uh, myself and my colleague Sudipta Goswami have been uh, have been doing as part of the EOSIS project. Um, we are based at the University of Reading and affiliated with the National Centre for Earth Observation. So EOSIS is a um, project that started at the start of this year and it's going to run for a couple of years. Um, and it's to support the development and uh, continued development of uh, data products derived from Earth observation data that give us insight into how the climate is changing. So if you like, they complement climate modeling and predicting forwards into the future by trying to build a very good record of what's happened in the past over roughly the period, um, depending on the data, but roughly going back to 1980 in some cases. Um, so these data products look at both the global picture, also for certain kinds of data, uh, regional areas like Africa, uh, looking at soil moisture there. Um, and there's also another part of the project which looks um, specifically at the, the UK and tries to, to build up a higher resolution picture. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, the partners of the EOSIS project are a wide, wide range of uh, teams across different universities. But part of the project, um, small part of the project, um, looks at the dissemination of the data and trying to help people to find their way to the data and, and help them use it. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so this is what we're calling the web portal, Work Package 2 in the EOSIS project. Um, it's really a, a way of linking um, together the different uh, data produced by the different partners um, and signposting the way for people to go and get that data in various ways. Um, and also, I think, makes sense of it, right? So when you're looking for data, there may be different sources that you can look at. We want to be able to quickly explain what the data is, is about, uh, what people could use it for, um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, help them find, find out what to do next. So currently we've built a prototype portal and website. Um, it's not up at the moment because Jasmine's down, but um, part of the talk is how we're running this on Jasmine. So we'll, 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 co we'll cover that in a minute. Um, so there's also mention of another project called the EO Data Hub. So what we think is there going to be some convergence or the EO Data Hub is going to absorb aspects of this project uh, of the, the, the pork part. But uh, we'll maybe talk about that at the end. So, yeah, as I mentioned, we're hosting um, the prototype of the portal on the Jasmine external cloud. It's currently running on a modest uh, medium instance. Um, we're trying to use Python for as much uh, as much as we can to for a sort of just consistent way of sending the services. Obviously, we're not writing everything ourselves. Um, we're relying on big open source projects um, wherever possible. And the three main components we see for the portal are. Um, a viewer, which gives us a sort of view of the data on a map. Um, a dashboard, which portrays um, applications which provide a bit more insight into various aspects of the data. And we'll, we'll see some examples of this in a minute. Um, and finally, a, a page for ordering subsets of the data. So a, a quick way to get, get to parts of the data and download them. Um, Obviously, they'll also be able to go to the, the archive on CEDA to download, and there'll be other ways to download the data from directly from the data providers' websites as well. So we'll, we'll link to those. So the, the end result is we hope that the portal will help people get at the data, understand it, start using it. And by the, the people, we're looking at a very wide range of, of, of potential users. So it could be scientists from other disciplines, not necessarily from the so environmental science, um, local government, um, the, the public, basically a large range of possible users. 
I have to keep moving on. Um, right, so the architecture looks a bit like this. Requests come in, um, NGX farms them out to various services. We've got these three apps, the, the dashboard, data ordering and data viewer. And then behind the scenes, we've got um, a bunch of services written in Python, most of which are based on open source projects. So I'll, I'll, I'll point out Open Data Cube for storing EO data. So we're using it to um, store and register level three and level four data mainly, but also some level two. So um, uh, th that's been pretty interesting. Um, but it's worked pretty well once we've learned, learned how to use it. Uh, and another thing we're using is an adapter called OWS, which can take the data from Open Data Cube and X-Ray and NetCDF and turn that into tiles on a map. Um, so that, that's, that's, been, that's been quite interesting to work with. Um, another part of this architecture is we've got a WordPress site uh, with some help from uh, Fazir Patel at NCO and um, other, other people from her team. Um, that sort of, sort of fulfills the role of generally kind of cataloging the data and providing links and information. I'm going to go through each of these, the apps in the portal briefly. Um, so viewer is the sort of the kind of thing you expect to see if you're looking at um, geospatial environmental data. So you're plotting things onto a map using maybe, um, here we're using um, OpenStreetMap as a base map and looking at sea surface temperature anomalies. So you can see uh, El Nino forming in the, in the uh, Eastern Pacific. Quite handy that that's been going on this this year. So we can we can um, easily see this in the viewer. Um, so we're using Open Data Cube and OWS. Um, sprinkled in a bit of our own code, we, we need to develop a a, dry, a special driver for NetCDF four files because um, uh, Open Data Cube I think works better with GeoTIFFs and, and other data formats. Um, whereas the data that we're receiving from our providers is is all in NetCDF. So um, uh, that was an interesting uh, aspect to this. Uh, data ordering basically gives you um, uh, a web page or form that you can fill out, say, to pick the data that you're interested in, the, the bounds in time and space, um, Possibly also uh, whether you want to coarsen the data to a to a lower resolution, um, and also the, the the format that you want to receive the data in. So for geospatial applications like Q QGIS and ArcGIS, um, it's maybe easier to consume the data in GeoTIFF rather than NetCDF. If you want to obtain a time series this way, then you can get that in NetCDF or in CSV. And then behind the scenes. There's a Python app which um, basically splits each job into parallel tasks and goes off and um, pulls the data out of the NetCDF archives and um, assembles it into the output format for download. Um, so this is based on um, some, a previous project we did. It's been running very happily on Jasmine for some years now, uh, just looking at ordering data for sea surface temperatures. Um, and yeah, the final point on this is we will be trying to, to, to provide a Python API next year sometime when we, when we can get it done so that you can automate the retrieval. You don't have to go to a form on a web page. I think probably the most interesting part of this project um, is to develop this idea of a climate dashboard where we can try and get some insight from the, the raw data. And of course, one thing that's been nice this year is that something really weird has been happening to sea surface temperatures. Um, you can see that line sticking out the top of this, which is looking at the, the, the annual variation of sea surface temperatures by day of year. You can see that 2023 is extremely unusual, um, possibly only partly explainable by El Nino and um, uh, climate change. Um, so we're 
building some prototype apps, um, we hope to get the data providers involved or at least get their insights into um, what's interesting and, and uh, what could be turned into insight on their on their data sets. Um, okay. So there's high resolution product support I mentioned earlier. Um, that will also go into the maps and um, we're thinking about how we can best serve UK users who want to look at this UK high resolution product. Um, still a little bit in those stages, but we're starting to develop um, I'm working on the Chuck side of this as well. We're starting to develop the, the data products for Chuck. <laughs> okay, getting towards the end, I think. Um, so as I mentioned, there's another project called the Data Hub, which is probably uh, a lot more ambitious. Um, so we'll want to interact with that project. And I think over time, the work we're doing will migrate to to run on the EO Data Hub uh, as, as, that, as that service gets developed. Um, so we'll be trying to get that process of migration going over the next year or so. Um, we may want to retain some parts of this project and it, other components may be reused for other projects as well. So, um, Okay, we're looking at, uh, yeah, other, other developments. So uh, Stack Support, so Stack is a, uh, a protocol for exposing Earth observation and other geospatial data that we're, we're interested in, in offering. Possibly this might be more of an EO data hub thing. Um, one, one thing I found was I thought that when I started this project or when Sudipta and I started this project, we thought that the hard bit would be writing all this software and gluing together the open source stuff um, and, and getting all the, the IT side sorted out and the, the web stuff. But actually, it's all about the subtleties in the data. We've got all of these different data providers. Each of their data sets are quite different. It's going to be quite difficult to onboard each of these data sets. We've got about four or five so far. We've got a lot more to do. Um, so we'll be talking to the, the, the partners in the EOSIS project and, and working out how, what, which of their data we should expose and which of these services. And, um, and, and yeah, so that, that, that has been a bit of an eye opener, really. Um, and we want to do much more on the dashboard apps and see what we, insights we can pull out of how the climate's been, been changing. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Time for a few questions. I sorry, it might be a stupid question. On uh, an earlier slide, you had a point that said British National Grid. Um, that is that the electricity company, or is that something else? Um, so that that's a, a it's a coordinate reference system designed to work well on over the UK. So it's EPSD two seven seven zero zero. So it's not the the British National Grid yeah, um, in terms of the, the electricity company, although. <laughs> Although I think they might be one of the organizations interested in the data that we're producing to look at the how how well their assets are going to do um, over you know, changing climates and things like that. So um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I think all of my colleagues at Sea will be really um, gratified to hear that you think it takes loads of time to get data um, on because, yeah, that's what we all struggle with. So is there something that you wish you'd known before that you could share? That, like, did you learn anything that would help other people doing similar things, I guess? I think basically have have meetings with the people providing your data as soon as possible, and um, you know don't don't wait till later in the project. Start talking immediately and talk about what 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 are the characteristics of their data sets, and yeah, don't don't sit there writing software for too long without talking. Obviously, you need to do that a bit, but you know, yeah, that would be my advice. Thank you.
Any more questions? Hi, um, really love to talk actually. And it's, it, I'll speak to you after more, but I'm really interested about how you've actually overlaid your data on the map. So do you mind maybe just give us a bit of how you've done that? Yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, it's basically using um, uh, an, uh, an OGC. I can't remember what OGC stands for, but it's a standard protocol for um, uh, building maps. So the client side is, is using a, a library called Open Layers. So it's a JavaScript and JavaScript and HTML thing. Um, talking protocol called w, WMS or Web Mapping Service to retrieve tiles of data for particular bounds uh, from the data store. Um, so on the back end, we're using a, 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 a an OGC WMS adapter to pull stuff out of the net, net CDF files and turn it into colorful tiles. Um, <coughs> so uh, yeah, but trying to stick to standard protocols and not write our own our own kind of thing that's reinventing the wheel. And is this pulling from net CDF like on the fly? Yeah, it's all done on the fly. So you're as you open a map, the open layers running in your browser will send a bunch of requests to the service to say get me this tile get me this tile get me this tile and you'll see those tiles popping up on your map as it loads um, so those are being generated on the fly from the underlying data from netcdf turned into uh, using a color ramp as, as, as it turns you goes to turn that into colorful pixels um, so one of the problems we faced is actually trying to work out what colors to use for which data sets and what's going to make most sense to, to the users. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, just one quick question. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I just wondered um, what you were doing the initial design for this. Did you look at other systems competitive software to like for example like, like don't NASA publish their um, data explorers things no announced platform. Yeah there are a huge number of these systems. I mean probably all used some of these if anyone looking at Earth observation data or environmental data will, will be will have already seen many, many of these. Um, so um, yeah a lot of them are more complicated than we thought we needed. Um, we have also had a lot of advice from the the there are partners, some of who have, have similar portals. So we've looked at those. Um, what we tried to do, what we tried to do in the end was basically keep it as simple as possible. So build a portal that's got very few controls um, so that let the data sort of speak for itself. Um, and most of the work is done by open layers on the client and um, the sort of backend standard software. So we're, we're really relying, I think most of the software out there is based on pretty much the same libraries. Um, so you will open source this um, as a system. Yeah, I think it will be it will be open sourced. I think um, yeah, that, that once we're a little bit further down down the line. Great, thanks. Yes.